Ibn Khuzaimah, one of the greatest Hadith scholars in the history of Islam, someone often referred to by Muslims as the Imam of the Imams, once made the following statement, If Allah does not have eyes, nor ears, nor hand, nor foot, then what we are worshipping is a watermelon. Ibn Khuzaima said this because according to him and what scholars refer to as the early traditionist school of Islam, fidelity to the Islamic sources, which teach that Allah has shape and form and so forth, demands that such terms be understood according to their apparent meanings or literal sense. If early Muslims like Ibn Khuzaima are right, then popular Muslim arguments against the Incarnation, which is usually misrepresented as belief in a man who's been deified, actually need to be redirected to the original teachings of Muhammad and his pagan followers. After all, according to the Orthodox Christian doctrine of the Incarnation, Christ is an eternally divine person who took upon himself or into union with himself a human nature in time, and as a result of that is one person with two natures, deity and humanity. But since Allah, according to the Qur'an and Hadith, never became incarnate, then the ascription to him of attributes like hand, feet, face, and so forth would have to apply to his allegedly eternal nature. To put it simply, if this earlier view is true, and over the course of several videos I'll argue that it basically is, then the Islamic deity is a man-god. Some Muslims try to predetermine how this question is answered by appealing to two verses of the Qur'an that they believe preclude interpreting statements about Allah's body or bodily appendages according to their apparent meanings or literal sense. And so before looking in subsequent videos at statements that speak directly to the issue, something first has to be said about these two passages. The verses in question are Surah 42.11 and 112.4. According to Surah 42.11, there's nothing like him, that is, like Allah. And according to Surah 112.4, there's none like unto him. Those who appeal to these passages tell us that they demand taking every statement in the Qur'an or in the Hadith that speak of Allah's face, fingers, foot, etc., no matter how clear, no matter how graphic such verses or narrations might be, in a figurative or allegorical way. For instance, Ibn al-Jazi, a 12th century Muslim writing against predecessors in his own madhab or school of thought, made the following statement in an attempt to brush aside the large number of Quranic verses and Hadith narrations about Allah's anatomy. All these, even if their outward expressions suggest likening God with creation, yet what is meant by them is the affirmation of his existence. And since the law knows full well of the illusions that may arise in the hearts upon hearing them, it cut through these illusions by stating, There is nothing like him. Quran 42.11 In other words, according to Ibn al-Jazi, since Surah 42.11 says there's nothing like Allah, any passage that speaks of Allah's shape, form, face, and so forth must be understood as affirming simply that Allah exists and not that he actually has the attributes ascribed to him. A more recent example of this kind of approach can be seen in the words of Sheikh Muhammad Hisham Kabani, who wrote the following. As shown in the excerpts, the priority was to repel false understandings and prevent the pitfall of attributing to Allah the characteristics of creation. Again and again, the paradigm that is the entire foundation for understanding Allah and his attributes is there is nothing like him whatsoever. Essentially, what Al-Jazi and Kabani are saying is that their understanding of these two passages which goes against the tide of what earlier Muslims believed about Allah and his attributes, must be made paradigmatic 
for the interpretation of any and every other statement in the Quran and Hadith on this issue. However, there are at least half a dozen problems with this approach. First, this approach arbitrarily assigns priority to two passages of the Quran over and against other passages, which essentially allows a person to ride roughshod over those other passages, no matter how clearly they might speak to the issue. But why give these two passages the priority rather than others? Second, this method is exegetically unsound. For as all good exegetes know, the, the possibility of misunderstanding what a couple of statements mean is greater than the possibility of misunderstanding the overall testimony of many clear statements. Third, and closely related to the previous problem, given uh, that there are hundreds of statements about Allah having a face, hands, etc., as we'll see, the idea that two passages of the Qur'an speak clearly to this issue, while hundreds of others do not, contradicts the Qur'an's own claim that it's a clear book in which everything is exhaustively detailed or explained. This would mean, at least on this issue, most of the statements in the Islamic sources are unclear, and most of the detail that Allah gives is virtually useless. Fourth, this approach assumes in advance that the Qur'an is not equivocal or inconsistent in what it teaches, saying in one place what it contradicts in another. But this, of course, is question-begging, an elementary logical fallacy. Fifth, these passages are actually easy to explain in a way that perfectly comports with the idea that Allah is an embodied being. For instance, the statement in Surah 42, 11 is simply saying that Allah is not one of a pair, that is, he doesn't have a mate. Notice the context in which the relevant statement appears in Surah 42, 11. Originator of heaven and earth, he has granted you spouses from among yourselves, as well as pairs of livestock, by means of which he multiplies you. There is nothing like him. He is the alert, the observant. Quran 42.11 In other words, Allah has no spouse or mate, like men and animals do. This has nothing to do with the idea that Allah is a formless being without parts or passions. Similarly, when Surah 112.4 says there's nothing like Allah, in context it's simply saying that Allah has no ascendant or descendant. He neither begets nor is begotten. It has nothing to do with the issue of whether or not Allah is the kind of being who has a body and limbs. Say, He is Allah, the One, Allah, the Eternal. He neither begat nor was begotten, and there is none like Him. Consider a conceivable parallel. If Adam, who was not begotten by anyone before him, were not given a wife so as to beget a child, then there would be no one like him either. But this wouldn't mean that Adam did not have a body. By the same token, the fact that Allah neither begets nor is begotten and is therefore unique doesn't mean that Allah is not an anthropomorphic being. Sixth, and finally, the Qur'an makes a similar comment elsewhere about the wives of Muhammad. In Surah 33:32, which has the same grammatical formation, it says the following, Wives of the Prophet, you are not like any other woman. Obviously, the statement, you are not like any other woman, does not mean that Muhammad's wives didn't have bodies like other women. In conclusion, since it is arbitrary, methodologically unsound, contrary to the Qur'an's own claim of being a clear book, begs the question and so forth to appeal to Surah 42.11 and 112.4 in order to decide the matter in advance, we will look at Islam's trusted sources in order to see if the deity of Muhammad and his original followers was a being with body and bodily appendages or if he was a watermelon. And just to give you a brief list of what we'll see in the Quran and Hadith, here's a foretaste. We will see that Allah has a shape, face, eyes, ears, two right hands, palms, fingers, fingertips, chest, waist, side, a shin, and a foot. We will also see that he has dimensions, mass, weight, for which reasons Allah is able to screen himself with a veil, live in a house, look out over a watchtower, 
plant trees, ascend and descend, run, shake hands, skim people's backs, and all of that is just skimming the surface.